Hey everyone, and welcome to lesson number two in the Praying Through It Bible Study series. I hope that you were able to access lesson one, and I hope you didn't have any problem opening up the video or opening up the links or anything like that. If you've had any trouble, please let me know so I can try to get that fixed for you. Just like in lesson one, there should be a link below this video to a worksheet, and you can print that off and follow along using that note sheet as we go through this lesson. Um, you do not have to have it though. You do not have to use the worksheet if you would rather not use that. That is completely up to you. In this lesson, we're going to focus on two different things. We're going to focus first on how we should pray, and that's going to look really at our responsibility. What is our part? in prayer. And then secondly, I'm going to give you some practical tips for strengthening your prayer life, and I hope that those will be very helpful to you. So first of all, let's talk about how we should pray. Number one, we should follow Jesus' example. Just like in everything else that we do, we should look to Christ as our perfect example, and we should do the same thing in prayer. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. So if you have a Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. You might recognize this scripture reference as being a portion of scripture that talks about the model prayer. And that is a prayer that is a good one to use as an example for us. And in this whole context, we're going to pull out four different things that we can learn about prayer. And so let me just read through this first. I'm going to read the, the scripture reference first, and then we will go through it. Starting in verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to, to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them. For your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The first thing that we learn from verses five and six is that we should pray secretly. Pray secretly. Jesus talks about the hypocrites who love to stand on the corners of the streets and then the, in the synagogues and they would pray where they could be seen and they would use many words and draw lots of attention to themselves. And Jesus says, don't be like that. Don't be like that. He said, pray in your room. Go into your room and shut the door and pray in secret. In other words, prayer is not for show. It's not to bring attention to yourself. In fact, when you are having personal prayer time, when you are having that, that intimate um, communion with God in prayer, you should go somewhere where there aren't any distractions, where you can have a nice, quiet, alone time with God free from interruption, if possible, and where it's just you and God, and you are talking to him by yourself in secret. I hope that, um, that you're able to find some time during the day to have that one-on-one -on -one quiet time with God. It's very important. We're gonna talk later about how we pray throughout the day, how we pray continuously and in different situations. But that time of quiet fellowship just with you and God is wonderful and strengthening and 
I, I hope that that's something that you can make a part of your daily life. So pray secretly. The second thing that we learn from this set of scriptures here is that you should pray sincerely. Pray sincerely. This is verses 7 and 8 in this context. He talks about how the heathen pray with vain repetitions. They pray with vain repetitions, thinking that they're going to be heard because of their many words. And he says, don't be like that. God already knows what you need. He wants to hear words from your heart. And so pray sincerely. That means pray authentically. God is not grading our prayers. He's not sitting up there thinking, hmm, that was a, that was a good one. Mm, that prayer was not so good. He's not grading our prayers. He just wants us to talk to him and he wants our words to come from our heart, from a very authentic place. When it says to avoid vain repetitions, the key word there is vain. All right, vain there means empty, meaningless. Don't just say something because you're in the habit of saying it over and over. It is okay to pray for the same things. It is okay. I pray for the same things daily. I pray for my children. I pray for my husband. I pray for our health. I thank God for the same blessings I feel like over and over. But I mean it. And so praying repetitiously is not wrong. It's using empty, meaningless repetitions, words that, that don't mean anything. You're just saying them because it seems like you should say them. It's something you've heard, something you say over and over, and there's no meaning behind it. That's vain repetition. So be careful of that. I have to tell you a cute story really quick. I have to tell it on my daughter, Evie, um, because it's so sweet. When she was little, and she would say prayers at night when we were in bed. She would go through and she would, she would talk about the things that she was thankful for. And she would say, thank you for our food and thank you for our family and thank you for our friends. She would always talk about those three things, our food and our family and our friends. Well, one night she was saying our prayer and she got to, you know, where she was talking about things that she was thankful for. And she said, and God, thank you for the three F's. And I thought, the three F's? We've kind of <laughs> shortened that down a little bit. And we are just grouping food and family and friends into the three F's. And so <laughs> anyway, we had to have, you know, kind of a little talk about making sure that our words are coming from our heart and that we're really expressing the things that we mean. And, you know, if we're getting to abbreviating things and the three F's, we might need to make sure that our words are coming from a very sincere place. And they were, she was being very sincere. It was just very cute. And um, anyway, I think about that when I think about repetitions. But anyway, God wants you and I to talk to him as if we were talking to a friend. He wants us to talk to him as a friend. I love the words in Fanny Crosby's song, Draw Me Nearer. Listen to these lines. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend, when I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. God wants us to have that real conversation with him, that heartfelt, authentic conversation. Number three, we should pray specifically. Pray specifically. This is from verses 9 through 13 of this text when Jesus actually gets into the prayer. He, prayer is not um, simply a list of things that you need. I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. And we see in this prayer that Jesus gave as an example that there were different elements in this prayer. So if you look for a second and you, you kind of go back through that prayer, work your way down through it, you see that there is praise in this prayer. There is praise. There is submission. 
your will be done. There's submission. There is a request. Give us this day our daily bread. And then there's this time of confession, this asking for forgiveness. And help us to forgive others and, and you forgive us. And, and there is this idea of confession. So different elements were covered in this prayer. It's a wonderful example. Prayer is not a shopping list of all the things that you want. It should have other elements. And we're going to talk more about that again underneath the practical application part. So we'll hold on to that and we'll talk more about it in a minute. The last thing that we take from this section is that we should pray steadfastly. This prayer says that um, it asks, give us this day our daily bread. It's a daily prayer. It's a prayer that is um, not just a one time, but talking about things that are needed, asking for things that are needed on a daily basis. So it is, um, it's a daily prayer. And I remember that, um, or it makes me think of, I guess I should say, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, that talks about praying without ceasing. We pray continually all throughout the day that we remember that prayer can come at any moment in any form and that we can pray for anything and everything. So pray steadfastly daily and we pray throughout the day. And we're also going to talk more about that underneath the application section. So remember to pray steadfastly. So when we follow Jesus' example, especially as it applies to this section of scripture right here, Matthew 6, verses 5 through 13, remember, pray secretly, pray sincerely, pray specifically, and pray steadfastly. Those are our four S's underneath that section. So let's move on. When we're talking about how we should pray, another thing that we should remember is that we should pray with the right attitude. We should pray with the right attitude. Luke chapter 18, if you have your Bible, you might flip over to Luke chapter 18. This is the example of the prayer between the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee and the tax collector. And you've probably heard this story when, we've, when you've talked about prayer um, in the past where two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. And the Pharisee essentially stood and was very loud and very um, uh, self-complimentary when he was praying. He said, I thank you that I'm not like other men and that I do this and I do this and I do this. But then the tax collector, standing far off, wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. He was lowered and, and, and beating his hands on his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. You have two very different prayers here. And Jesus said in this situation that it was the tax collector that went away justified. The tax collector went away justified. Pray in sincerity, in reverence, and in humility. We have to remember whose throne we're approaching, who we are in the presence of God. And we should have a humble and reverent attitude. Number three, how should we pray? We should pray in faith. We should pray in faith. And this just means that you believe in what you're praying for and who you're praying to. Matthew chapter 21 Verses 21 through 22 talks about believe and you will receive. Believe and you will receive. We can't pray and not expect God's, um, God to answer. We can't pray and doubt his ability to hear and to respond. And so we have to go into our prayers in faith believing that God is there, believing that he is hearing every word, and believing that he has the power to answer. Number four, how should we pray? We should pray with understanding. 
We should pray with understanding. We have to know the limitations of prayer and the will of God. We can't ask God for something that would require him violating his own will. We can't ask for something that is against his commands or against the instruction that he has given us, against his word. We can't ask for something that would be in direct opposition to what he has told us or what he has revealed in his word. He's not going to violate his own will in order to satisfy man. And we shouldn't expect him to. We shouldn't expect that to happen. His will is good and it's perfect and acceptable. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, that we just read a few minutes ago, remember the words of that prayer, thy will be done. Thy will be done. We have to pray with understanding. And part of that also is understanding that God's providence is going to prevail. Romans chapter 8, 28 is that wonderful verse that talks about how all things are going to work together for good for those who love the Lord and for those who are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean that that terrible things are necessarily going to bring about something good. There are some things that happen that I don't know that you could say, oh, look at what one, look at what great thing happened as a result of that. Some things, I don't know that that's an easy thing to say. The idea is that God is always working in our lives and that he can take things that happen and use them in a way that will bring glory to him. Some things I'm going to say, I don't know that we'll ever really understand until we're in heaven one day. But we have to know that God's providence is working, that he can redeem any situation, that he can redeem any person. And we have to believe that and understand that when we talk to him in prayer. And finally, we pray through Christ. We pray through Christ. The avenue to God is through Christ. John chapter 14, verse six, Jesus says, no man comes to the Father but by me. And then we can remember Jesus' teaching in John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Let's just turn over there really quick to John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. And I will read that. It's a good way to kind of close out this section right here. It says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Notice how Jesus said that twice. He said it twice. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. So we should pray through Christ. All right, so that's that's some, some things to think about when it comes to our responsibility in prayer. So let me close this lesson out with giving you some practical things, some practical tips to help you strengthen your prayer life. Number one, and I think this is big. I know this is big for me. Number one, be still. Be still. Sometimes we just have to slow down. We have to just take a minute to, to breathe and to stop. We need to get away from the busyness of life for just a minute. If you don't have time to pray, then you're too busy. If I don't have time to pray, then I'm too busy. I need to look at my life and look at what I'm doing and say, wow, if I don't have time during my day to stop and to talk to my creator, my heavenly father, then I need to look at my schedule and I need to see where my time is going. So be still, that's number one. Number two, stay organized. 
stay where this will help your prayer life. Organization. I know some of you that are my non-organizers are like, no, but just if you think about and plan a little bit, then prayer time is a, a little more manageable. Number one, underneath this idea of staying organized, you can, you can, um, there's lots of different apps, different things that you have now available on um, your phone, your iPad, your laptop, whatever it is that you use, you can have um, notifications that remind you to pray. A little chime that goes off that says, it's time to pray, stop to pray. That's a great way to get organized in your prayer life. You can use a prayer journal and you can write down your prayers. You can use a, um, a, a prayer notebook. I love this idea to take a little notebook that you keep next to your laptop or somewhere on hand whenever you are um, breezing through Facebook and you see prayer requests that your friends or family have asked for you to remember, you can take your little notebook and write those down as you go. Because a lot of times, you know, we'll type back, I'm praying for you. We wanna make sure that when we say that, I'm praying for you, that we really are, that we really are taking that prayer request and bringing it to God. So that's very important. Try different methods of praying. The ACTS prayer, ACTS, the acronym for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, A-C-T-S. That's a good way to keep yourself, keep your thoughts on track in, in prayer. Um, you can always go back to the little five finger prayer that we teach children when they were younger, and you can Google that and see um, how, you do, how you do that. You can schedule prayer time. Look at your daily planner. Where do you have time that you can spend some, a portion of time with God specifically? So stay organized. Number three, remain focused. Remain focused. Remember that first point in how we should pray. Pray secretly. Maybe think about having a praying place, a praying place. There is a place where I sit every morning and I get up way before everybody else gets up and I have my coffee, I have my Bible reading time, my, my personal devotional time, and that's my praying time. And I sit in my chair at the counter and that is my praying place. If there are people here, if there are um, people in the house and I need to get away to a quiet place, I go to my closet and shut the door and I'll pray in my closet for a while. Have a place where you go. And then something somebody told me one time that I think is a great thing is to pray for your distractions. Whatever your distractions are when you're praying, pray about that, that maybe, um, Pray, pray for them. Maybe your distractions are your children. Use that as a time to, to pray for your children. Um, if it is work, then pray about that. Pray about those things and, um, and make that a way to remain focused in your prayer time. All right, number four, find time to pray in unique places. Find time in unique places. I just talked about getting up early. You know, sometimes Jesus got up while it was still dark or he prayed at night when he could be alone. Pray when you're in the car. Some of you, if you commute to work or commute to school, that's a great time to have some conversation time with God. You can pray while you're exercising, while you're walking or jogging on that treadmill or while you're taking a walk or running in the neighborhood. That could be prayer time. I had a friend one time tell me that she prays while she's ironing or prays while she's folding clothes, prays while she's washing dishes, while she's doing things around the house. She uses those moments, those unique places as times to pray. All right, let's see. I think we're on number five. A way that you can help your prayer life is to teach kids to pray. Teach kids to pray. Wow, that is that is really powerful because they are learning from your example. 
What you may not realize is while you're teaching them to pray, you are benefiting. You are teaching yourself how to pray. You are taking the pointers that you're giving them and you can apply them to your own life. Teach kids to pray. You know, when you teach anything, and, and I'm sure some of you have said this before, whenever you teach something, you as the teacher grow even more sometimes than the students. And so I think that's true with prayer too. As you train your children how to do that, you will grow from that as well. Take opportunity to lead prayers. If you have an opportunity in a ladies class or at a, um, at a ladies event or you know, with your children, lead prayers. Lead them when you have an opportunity. That will help you. Some, sometimes people are uncomfortable with that and that's, that is kind of stepping on toes or making them a little bit nervous. But truly, the more that you do that, the easier that it gets. And the more that you pray in your personal life, the easier that will get to lead a prayer in a group. And um, I think you'll find that that will become easier and easier as you do it more and as you practice more in your personal life. Be genuine. Be genuine. The more you talk to God, the more genuine that you will sound. But remember, as we talked about in the how we should pray, remember the, um, the sincerity. You want to make sure that when you're talking to God, you are talking to him um, as if he were there with you because he is there with you. Talk to him like you're talking to a friend. And I don't mean flippantly. I don't mean disrespectfully. There is always that reverence there. But it just means wholeheartedly, very, very authentically. Avoid redundant words. Avoid redundant words. Sometimes to do this, we might have to do some um, prayer exercises, some prayer exercises. So here's some things that you can do in order to avoid redundant words. And what I mean by redundant words, these are unnecessary uh, repetitious words. They are words that are kind of needless or useless. You're just using them because it sounds like you should use them. Um, we want to try to avoid that because this comes back to the point we made just a second ago, be genuine. So we want to make sure that our words are meaningful. But there's some things that you can do here. If you have, um, if you struggle with words, one of, the, one of the things that you can do is pray the Psalms. That's a wonderful exercise. Go um, into the Psalms and find one that um, the, the theme of that particular psalm fits whatever it is that you have on your heart. Maybe it is a praise psalm. Maybe it is a psalm of confession. Maybe it is a psalm of um, asking for forgiveness. Maybe it's a psalm asking for strength. You can find this and you can just do a Google search on those and you will get the psalms um, according to their themes. And you can pick one and and. Pray it. Use the words given by the Holy Spirit and, and use those in your prayer life. And that's not using, that's not vain repetitions. That is, that is finding a way to express what you're feeling. And it's a prayer exercise. It's a way to get better at finding words that you want to say that capture what is in your heart. I also told people sometimes you can write um, a prayer out as a note. Write it out as a thank you note. If you've got something that you want to talk to God about and you can't find the words to pray, sometimes you might be able to find the words to write. So you can write a letter, write out a prayer to God. That's a good way to, um, to practice finding the right words. And then finally, on my practical tips for you, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't be too hard on yourself. Prayer is big. It is a grand privilege. It is not a small thing. Prayer is coming into the presence of our Almighty God and talking to Him. 
that is is beautiful and it's big so if you're struggling to to feel stronger and more confident about it don't be hard on yourself that's okay but don't abandon it it is too big a part of your spiritual life to not give it the attention that it needs just keep keep doing it keep working every day to strengthen your prayer life because there is nothing there is nothing that is that is better that is more encouraging that is more strength building than coming into the presence of God and talking to him communicating with him remember he is your power source so that's where we're going to stop today Starting tomorrow, we are going to get into the, some specific prayers that we find in the Bible. I'm so excited. We're going to look at 12 different prayers, and we're going to see what we can learn from them and how we can apply them to our prayer lives. So that's coming up tomorrow. But to end, I'm going to give you a prayer prompt. My prayer prompt for you for today is to try that ACTS prayer, the A-C-T-S prayer. That is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So try to pray and try to incorporate each one of those elements into your prayer. And I put up here on the board, on my little fake um, whiteboard up here, um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, as a scripture to keep in mind. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then I put a little um, notes down here that supplication is referring to our humble, um, our humble request for personal needs. Humbly asking for what it is that we need. And then thanksgiving is doing it with a spirit of gratitude. And so there are a couple elements that are talked about in this verse. So I want you to try today in at least one of your prayers to, to pray those different elements. Adoration, that's praise, praise for God. And then confession, this is whatever you might be struggling with. This might be where you ask for forgiveness. Um, and then thanksgiving, talk about your gratitude for the blessings in your life. And then supplication, finally talk about the things that are on your heart, the needs that you might have or what you would like to pray for other people. So I hope this has been a great lesson for you. I hope it is something that you can use and that you can apply to your life. Tomorrow we'll jump into those, those individual prayers in the Bible. Join me for Lesson 3 tomorrow. I love you and I hope you have a wonderful day.